All right, so today we are going to look at enlightenment ideas and reforms. And our main focus for this portion of chapter eight, section two, will be to look at the ideas of Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. And we're also going to look at how England transitions from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy. So if you notice on this first slide, it lets you know that the information in black is what you will fill in the blank. So hopefully you have opened up the Word document that is the guided notes worksheet at the bottom of the page of our week five lesson. And everything that's in blue is the extra stuff that I add when I do in-class lecture that I would write on the board or I say, and it's in blue for you to know that you do need to add it to your paper too. So let's look here at what's going on in England and how we're going to come up with these two ideas regarding governments. So there's two major events that actually shape people's views on government. And the people's views that we're talking about here are Hobbes and Locke. One is the English Civil War and the other one is the Glorious Revolution. Now the English Civil War we are seeing take place under the Stuart Dynasty. James I and then his son Charles I and he's going to be the king during the English Civil War who's going to end up be executed at the end. He was a king who had a lot of issues with Parliament and a lot of issues with the different religious affiliations. In the end his execution will end the monarchy for quite some time and then they're going to be under the control of Oliver Cromwell who will establish a commonwealth and then a protectorate. Cromwell's reign will end in 1658 and his son Richard will take over until 1660 and upon the end of Richard Cromwell's reign then the parliament will actually go and ask Charles II to return. But that English Civil War is what's going to really shape Hobbes's view and what Hobbes has seen during this time he believes that human nature is at the heart and the root of a lot of issues. We are in conflict, always in constant conflict, that we are selfish people who act in our own self-interest, that we are not thinking of our fellow man. And when Oliver Cromwell manipulated Parliament to execute the king, it was in his own self-interest. It was a shock to Europe that the people voted to have the king executed and publicly chopped off his head. And for Hobbes, this was a step that was completely uncalled for. He saw us as people who were born evil, that we all have this nasty little monster growing inside of us who's just waiting to rear its ugly head. And that the only way that we can keep ourselves contained and under control is that we needed a strong ruler, a strong ruler who would maintain order and stability within our lives, within our nation. In his book, The Leviathan, he addresses a social contract, and we are going to look at three separate social contracts throughout this section. The first one is Hobbes's, and in his social contract, he says, we the people must be willing to give up our rights. We hand our rights over to a strong leader, one who has promised to bring us order and stability. Now, keep in mind, this is a contract. It's like a legal agreement. So we hand our rights over to a leader who brings order and stability. And if they fail to do so, we take those rights back. They lose the power. Hobbes in no way will support us executing a leader for failing. We just remove the power and we give it to someone else. Under the social contract, the power comes from the people. That is something that Locke and Hobbes will both have in common. They won't agree on the type of government that needs to be established, but they both agree that the power comes from the people. And for Hobbes, he sees that man is in a constant state of war, that that evil little monster inside of us, we see things and we want it and we go and take it. And then the person we're taking it from, their natural instinct is to defend it, is to protect it. And then we are in a fight. We are going back and forth with each other. And that's why we need to have a strong leader. For Hobbes, the best type of government is to have an absolute monarchy, not one that rules by divine right. Remember, yesterday or earlier this week in your class, 
we had actually talked about some absolute monarchs believe that their power comes from God. So they rule by divine right and they don't answer to man and they don't have to listen to us. But Hobbes says, no, that's not true. We hand our power over to them. We give them that power. Their power comes from us, not a higher being. So if they fail to do their job, it is our right to take that power back. Locke is going to be different. He is going to be shaped more by the glorious revolution, that transition that England's going to make from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional one. So when we look at his views on government, it too is based on human nature. He sees that we are shaped by our experiences, the good and the bad, that we learn from those experiences and we can become better people. Yes, we are going to have bumps in the road. Yes, we are going to make mistakes. We are going to flaw. We are going to do things to hurt ourselves and to hurt people, but we can learn from it and we can make ourselves better people. He sees us born as a blank slate and through our life experiences, we start to develop the kind of people that we're going to become. And those are people that can be trusted in order to govern themselves. So if I refer to you as a Hobbes, when you wrote your process question, then you were someone who said that no, people can't be trusted. If you said yes, people can be trusted to govern themselves, then I wrote you, marked you down as Locke. You share views like John Locke. In Locke's work on his two treatises of government, and this particular document is one that here in the United States, we definitely embrace wholeheartedly. We believe, as John Locke did, in a self-government, a government where people can participate, a government where people have a voice, a democratic society. Now, please don't misunderstand that he is pushing for a direct democracy or a republic, because that's not the type of government he's going to say is the perfect government. We won't see that type of government like a republic that we are used to until our founding fathers actually create the government that we have. Our natural rights, that we are born with life, liberty, and property, that God has given man these rights at birth, and man cannot take them away. And that when you look at what the government should do, it should protect them. That all men are created equal. They are all born free. Now, I do have in here people because in 2020, we do see this apply as people. But back in the 16 and 1700s, they really were only looking at a particular group of men that this would apply to. The power coming from us, coming from the consent of the people, is the same as what we saw with Hobbes. We provide the power to that government. The government, in return, protects our natural rights. That's the government's job of life, liberty, and property. Our second social contract comes from Locke. And under this, it says, if the government fails, and that is failing to protect our natural rights, it is our duty as citizens, it is our right as citizens to overthrow that government and create a new one. A lot of students get hung up on the, oh, we can overthrow something. Well, there's a second part to that. You then create a government that protects the people's rights. So you create a government that does the job that the previous one did not. We will utilize, <clears throat> excuse me, Locke's social contract here in our country when we were a colony. When we look at what England was doing to us as a colony, violating our natural rights. And Thomas Jefferson and our founding fathers will spell out exactly what England did, where they failed to protect our rights, and why we are justified in order to break away, dissolve the bands that tie us, and create a new one, one that will do its job. Many at this time, as we move into the age of the Enlightenment, believe that England embodied John Locke's ideas, their government, when they had transitioned from an absolute to a constitutional. 
England's constitutional monarchy does become the best model that Europe sees. So when we move into the age of the Enlightenment and we start to see what's happening in the other countries, they're wanting their government to change over like England's did. But exactly how did England get to be that particular model? Well, when Charles II was invited to come back into England and restore the monarchy, he brings back the Stuart dynasty. And the people loved him. We had the Merry Monarch. Now, Parliament had a few issues with him. They were a little hesitant because it had been since Mary I, they actually had a Catholic on the throne. And Charles II wasn't willing to be a little open about his religious affiliation, although he attended the Anglican Church, just like he was supposed to do. And he's the head of the Anglican Church. But they were a little leery and they didn't want Catholics in the government. But the problem that Charles is going to run into is that his younger brother, James, is very proud that he is Catholic and that he and his Catholic wife are going to have a little baby. And as a, if it's a boy, it would be heir to the throne, just like him. Parliament will approach Charles I and ask him to please remove the line of succession away from your brother because they did not want him on the throne. And Charles II refuses to do so. He does not have any children with his wife, the queen. And so naturally it would fall along the lines of his brother would be the next in line. So Charles lets Parliament know that he does not want to uh, use up their time any longer. And that as the king, he has the power to call them into session and to send them home. And at this time, he will choose to send them home and to rule without them. And he will do that until he ends his reign. His brother James does exactly what he had promised he would do when he became king, and that was to start to put Catholics back into government positions. Well, Parliament was not in agreement with us, and a lot of people wanted to remove the Catholics, and they wanted James off of the throne. So they approach James's daughter from his first marriage. She was raised a Protestant, and she was married to William of Orange, who was also a Protestant from the Netherlands. And this is what they present to them. They would give them the crown of England if they would help push James off of the throne and agree to become a constitutional monarch. So William and Mary agree to the English Bill of Rights, which establishes England as a constitutional monarchy. This document protects the rights of the people from the monarch. It limits the power of the king and queen, and it increases the power of parliament, which is something that parliament has been struggling with for quite some time. Now, since they've had this transition in this glorious revolution, which was not um, like the English Civil War, where you had the war and you had the blood and people were killed and executed in the end, this was an easier transition William and Mary established a constitutional monarchy, which then created a government that the rest of Europe was hoping to achieve. Not the absolute monarchs, of course, because then they have to share their power. But everyone else was hoping that their country, too, could lead to that constitutional monarchy. So when we look here at the very end, Locke's ideas do become that foundation for modern democracy. And we are going to see how Locke's ideas will transition over here into the American colonies and eventually to creating the United States. We will also pull from the various Enlightenment thinkers that we're going to look at next week and create a government that no one else had seen. Then we will become that model that other revolutions will hope. To achieve. So at this time, now that we have finished the this portion of our eight two notes, I'd like for you to read chapter eight, section two, and look at the Enlightenment philosophes from all of the other countries and their ideas. Your terms and questions are to be ready by the beginning of class, your class period, on Monday. If you finish them before then, please feel free to upload your terms and questions onto Schoology, but if not, at the start of class on Monday, whether you are physically here with me 
or at home, we need to have an upload. All right. Have a good one, everyone.